how, as an organization, did you go about prioritizing the cases to bring? Uh, again, you mentioned that there were limited resources, not a lot of paralegals, fairly lean and mean. Um, did the cases come up from the local um, federations, or uh, how, how did you decide which cases to bring? It's uh, a good question. Um, so, uh, at the National Wildlife Federation level, a primary tenet has always been for the litigators to focus on actions that are precedent setting. Um, I learned this firsthand when I was on the other side in Minnesota and I was picking up the phone in the law firm library begging the National Wildlife Federation lawyer who was sitting in my shoes at the time to bring a case on a wetlands drainage project out in western Minnesota. And it was just it's like it's too fact specific. Uh, the response was, "We just we just don't have the resources to bring a case like that that's very localized." So the focus has really always been pretty exclusively on bringing precedent-setting litigation, and particularly around this issue of Clean Water Act 404 jurisdiction. Now I'm talking now just specifically in the wellness field. So the notion was. Um, on the issue of geographic jurisdiction, like the waters of the U.S. and which waters are covered, and on the issue of which activities are covered, like the Tullock case, these were important precedent-setting cases because they really went to the question of, is the Corps of Engineers going to have to review a 404 permit and at least try to get these projects into the 404 individual permit process so that there would be sufficient environmental scrutiny to try to influence those projects. So that was the basic approach. You worked with the Corps and with EPA and Fish and Wildlife, um, and at the same time over the years there have been some lawsuits brought by the National Wildlife Federation against those agencies. You mentioned the Tulloch case. Um, and I know it's hard to generalize because each case is different, um, but, but are there things that you could identify as reasons why it becomes necessary in times to challenge decisions made by those agencies? I mean, is it uh, political pressure? Is it a lack of resources by the agencies that leads them to make some decisions that are not perhaps defensible um, or short congressional deadlines or judicial deadlines? Um, is there any pattern or is it each case a little bit different? I, uh, I think I think in most cases, it's it's a combination of all those, and it depends mm -hmm. a little bit on the level at which the you know the the bad action is happening. Right. <laughs> but um, I guess to you know as a as a higher level matter, just just to get back, while we are not actively making a point of litigating cases, we still do. Our work still depends heavily on litigation, in the sense. So often, what we will do is team up. We can, we've had a long-standing pattern of teaming up with the Southern Environmental Law Center, for example. Um, we're in the middle, I'm actually in the middle of another amicus brief right now, um, teaming up with the Southern, Southern Environmental Law Center. So my point is that, that being able to have that threat of litigation and being able to have that litigation out there is really important. And tying it back to the agencies, having worked inside the agencies, um, it's important, I think, it's important for them to be able to do their jobs, to have us there able to litigate um, carefully, able to litigate and support, to provide the support and the push for them to actually do their jobs according to the law. Because there are these serious threats. Um, I mean, it's starting kind of at the ground up. Um, when I've brought litigation in South Florida uh, that involved panther habitat and in wetlands involved endangered species, panther habitat, um, uh, whooping, uh, not whooping crate, uh, wood stork habitat, and you have these very dedicated, very capable um, biologists on the ground trying to do the right thing and having their jobs directly threatened. Um, in a way that goes right up the chain to Washington, D.C., to the head, you know, senior people in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. 
Um, and to see that happen, um, it just it's just a perfect example of how uh, at that level, when you're talking on the ground litigation, you have um, lobbyists from D.C., you have companies hiring Washington, D.C. lobbyists to effectively threaten the job of a consultant that's out there on the ground in southwest Florida trying to make the right call. So it's very important to have um, lawyers who can come in and expose the record and um, force action and compliance with the law. When you're talking about work we're doing now, say, on the waters of the U.S. rulemaking, um, at that level, uh, you, you do see a lot of, um, I mean, we're seeing it kind of at the other end of the extreme. You, you have real political pressure on the party in power to um, avoid any controversy that involves uh, big corporate money in order to stay in power. I mean, there's, there's no two ways about it. And then in between, I think you do have a lot of agency capture. Um, one thing we're working on right now are on the Farm Bill side, um, the Farm Bill has just passed, and you have uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is, a, you know, again, very committed people working on the ground to try to improve soil and water conservation on agricultural land. They have legal responsibilities under the Farm Bill, um, but, and those sometimes involve um, applying penalties to farmers who convert wetlands in violation of the law. And yet, um, it's very hard for them to be able to actually uh, follow the letter of the law. And so again, that's another case where I think um, it's important to have the, the threat of litigation out there in order to encourage good rules and good policies and good individual decisions.